Right, great question. So this person's asking, in a time when we're very blessed in a way with so much choice, so many teachings on YouTube and so many retreats, day retreats organized by London Insight and other groups, uh, how do we actually find a teacher who can help us kind of with our uh, practice and particularly in, with places that we get stuck <coughs> in the practice? Yeah. So this is quite a common question that comes because I do think a lot of people are looking for a teacher, a personal teacher who they can talk to, and it's actually quite difficult um, to find such teachers. Um, and the Buddha did say that it's important to listen to the Dhamma. Dhamma uh, Savana means it's one of the highest blessings actually to be able to listen to the Dhamma. But also Dhamma Sakacha, Dhamma discussion, is really, really important. And um, for this reason, I guess monasteries are established um, because certain organizations will have different teachers coming and it, you won't get the same people every time. And that's great, you know, in order to find maybe people that you resonate with or um, different approaches <coughs> that are helpful at different times. But I do think having people who actually stay in one place and that you can access more frequently is very helpful. And certainly that's what I've gone for in my um, monastic life. You know, it's one of the reasons I became a monastic was to have that teacher-student relationship. And then I would choose the place I want to be based on the teacher. Um, unfortunately, quite often, uh, nuns aren't even allowed to stay in those monasteries, which are often for monks. So that is difficult. But uh, I think what I've learned from my main teachers now, Ajahn Gam and Ajahn Gramali, is to go to the suttas and to find more and more guidance from the Buddha himself. Uh, because different teachers will speak from their own experience and it will be limited. So it may or may not help, or it may help at some times in your practice and not at others. So for me, it's been a complete life changer really and practice changer to actually have more of a sense of how the suttas uh, present the Dhamma and how they all kind of connect you know, like there are these themes that keep running through the different suttas and they all fall into the category of either the Eightfold Path or the gradual training, which gives a prescribed kind of um, a journey, let's say, in meditation. And it does talk a lot about the pitfalls, but you do have to have, I think it helps a lot to have teachers who can explain that to us. So I would say, personally, being a Buddhist monastic, go for teachers who have some knowledge and understanding of the texts, because you will always find that a really reliable um, way to gauge whether you're on track or not. Um, and then make a relationship with teachers that do live, say, in this country. So you can go to monasteries, or you can come to online stuff as well. Like we have a sutta discussion group every week, and it's international, so we go through a particular a book on social and communal harmony and we all learn together and that's really nice too because it doesn't always have to be like a top-down model it can also be you know learning from one another and learning in ways that we can really apply the teachings to our lives so I would suggest getting involved with something like that and seeing you know how far it takes you like and then changing and also noticing um, with any teacher the most important thing is do they have at least equal, but hopefully uh, better virtue than oneself. You know, something that you can really look up to um, and, you know, that makes them trustworthy. Um, so they don't have to be perfect, otherwise you probably won't find anyone. Um, but at least their, you know, ethical conduct, the way they live, their value systems, whether they're inclusive, whether they're discriminative, you know, the value systems that they hold should be really um, laudable and something that you you know you can look up to and take inspiration from so that's one of the best ways to gauge whether a teacher is reliable or not yeah so this lady's asking um, how do you decide between the breath meditation and the loving kindness especially if your inclination is to the loving kindness or it could be vice versa right so that even when you do the breath you incline more to the loving kindness again so wonderful, it doesn't really matter. Um, I'm similar to you, so I also sometimes wonder if I should emphasize the loving kindness even more because I do have a natural inclination that way. Um, and so I do spend quite a lot of time in loving kindness meditation. And I usually only go to the breath when it 
when my mind doesn't want to kind of mm, direct itself towards that loving kindness anymore, or when the mind naturally just wants a bit of peace and a bit of somewhere to rest. So otherwise, I do tend to emphasize the loving kindness, and that's perfectly fine because that's another way into the deep meditations. Uh, basically, the four jhanas, which are accessed through breath meditation, can also be experienced through loving kindness, uh, compassion, mudita, and equanimity. Uh, so, yeah, go with what you're inclined to, I would say. And um, it doesn't have to be either or, but, you know, just, just go with what your mind uh, feels it needs to do because often it's wiser than the controller inside us. <laughs> yeah, so if it works, that's great. Yeah. Okay, so you're saying that you found uh, your mind was settling and going quite deep today in the meditation and you're wondering if you can recreate that and, um, in your daily life. Um, so yes, obviously it's natural to want to incline more deeply in the meditation, but the danger comes when we want to recreate things because you actually experienced that peace today because of coming out of the pattern of creating, presumably. It came from letting go. And this is the tricky part of the mind that when we have a pleasant experience, we want to kind of cling to it and we want it to last. Because, I mean, in my meditation experience anyway, it's highly unlikely I experience exactly the same thing time and again. Every experience is new. And every experience is valuable. So even if your mind's wandering more in the walking meditation, that's also a way to learn about your mind. So rather than making like the depth of meditation the goal. See if you can make the idea of learning about your mind and the way it works more of a goal. And then you'll start to focus, you'll start to see causes. You'll start to see cause and effect. And uh, you'll start to realize that it is when you let go of expectations and wanting to create a particular experience that you have a chance to learn from the mind exactly what it's showing you right now. So, I mean, that's probably not the answer you want at all, but uh, <laughs> to, keep progressing in meditation, you know, to keep uh, deepening the practice is just to have that consistency, you know, and see if you can um, carve some time out every day to sit quietly. But in the meantime, while you are engaged with your daily activities, to see if you can notice when the mind is getting pulled into craving and clinging and, you know, on the one hand or irritability, etc., on the other. And just to see if you can find ways to bring it back in a wholesome way, into a wholesome way. And uh, it's all of that kind of uh, groundwork that yields the results when you do have time to sit. But if you start looking for those results, it doesn't really happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so this person saying that earlier on I spoke about um, difficulties in meditation due to my life situation and how do you meditate when you have those difficulties that you can't remove, right? Yeah, so um, yeah, the difficulties I spoke about were really um, based on a busy life rather than a life that's going in the wrong direction. So there aren't actual obstacles in the sense that anything's going against the practice, but it's more a lack of time to actually uh, sit and, and allow the mind to really quieten and to, you know, have as much time for retreat as I used to have. So the way that I personally deal with that situation is to realize that everything I'm doing is a part of the practice, which is kind of why I like to teach this kind of retreat, because as I was saying earlier, you know, it's an eightfold path. It's not only um, right mindfulness and right samadhi, it's also right speech, right action, right livelihood, you know, and right view right effort, et cetera, et cetera, um, and right motivation, I think most importantly. So for me, when I find that I'm getting a bit grumpy because I'm busy or I'm tired, I just try to remind myself that everything I'm doing is motivated by kindness and compassion towards others. And sometimes I do notice it's that lack of compassion to myself that I don't take enough of a rest. So that's one thing, you know, to learn to take a lot more rests. Um, but also just to recollect that whatever I'm doing is wholesome, you know, and that can bring joy to the mind because, you know, when we do a lot of good in our lives and we just, at the end, all we feel is the tiredness, we can get discouraged. But if you actually think about what you've been doing, what you've been giving to others or, 
you know, even sometimes not giving too much out of compassion for yourself, then that brings a sort of gladness to the mind. And it's kind of keeping the mind cleaner, if you like, so that if you do have a bit of time to meditate, you don't have all that kind of negativity there to deal with, first of all. So I think it's really just about making the best of whatever you have to, um, yeah, whatever you have to do in your life. Yeah. So in a sense, you're asking about the nature of enlightenment and whether it's still subject to the rules of impermanence or whether it's something that transcends all of that. And my answer would be um, the second, only I wouldn't call it a state because my understanding of um, Nibbana is that it's actually an ending of affliction. It's an ending of greed, hate, and delusion. So it's actually... Um, yeah, it is something that's not subject to suffering, not subject to impermanence, because anything that's impermanent is bound to be um, a source of sorrow for us, you know, whether it's something unpleasant that disappears or something pleasant. Either way, actually, just the very fact that it's changing all the time means it's not really reliable at all. Um, so, yeah, Nibbana is an ending of that. Um, but it's not as such a mental state. So once greed, hate, and delusion are uh, removed, you still continue to live, um, and you still continue to function in the world. You still see, hear, smell, taste, touch. You still have a body, perceptions, consciousness. But the greed, hate, and delusion isn't there. So you, know, you just experience bare experience without adding that suffering on. Um, but there is no chance for those things to re-arise. So it's not as though one day you're kind of enlightened, the next day a bit less, the next day you forget about it completely and you're <laughs> breaking your precepts, and the next day you're enlightened again. It's actually an uprooting of those things, like completely from the mind. So you've completely transformed, um, yeah, your conditioning to be in line with the Dhamma, to be in line with the path. So instead of that, I mean, as I understand it from teachers that inspire me, um, the qualities of compassion and loving kindness, equanimity and, and sympathetic joy are very, very strong. Um, so when people, you know, have that much metta, it's a very different quality of love. It's something that's not sticky, it's not clingy, it's not possible to get defiled, although I hate that word. <laughs> um, it's actually something that's really benevolent and, and completely selfless, and in that sense can really heal. Yeah. So you're asking about um, temporary experiences or glimpses, or he actually uses the word pusati, like to touch. Um, before attaining parinibbana, and of course that's the case, yeah, absolutely. Um, and with each uh, experience, you know, um, certain fetters are overcome. So at the first stage of enlightenment stream winning or stream entry, uh, the fetter of doubt, um, viewing things in terms of a self rather than in terms of conditioned arising, let's say, and uh, the belief that rites and rituals or any kind of dogma or um, adherence to rules can in itself uh, bring about that enlightenment state. Um, so those things are undermined with the first stage. And subsequently, there can be other stages as well. There can be other, uh, let's say, experiences of, um, of what will happen after you die, um, but it's not full Nibbana, unless you're now, I guess, until afterwards, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I can't speak from experience on this, but this is my understanding from the suttas and from my teachers who have asked about this in detail, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just dangerous to talk about them as states or, I mean, even experiences in a way, because they're not things that you get, they're more, Mm, outcomes of having let go of something that causes suffering. So people who've had those profound experiences will never say, I've had this, I've had that, I'm a such and such. They'll never speak in those terms. They'll just look at themselves. One of my teachers put it really beautifully. He said, you know, you can have a lot of profound experiences on the path, but whenever that happens, you know, you just look like, okay, so what's gone and what's left? You know, what suffering is left to remove? I mean, why should there be any ego or pride around that? It's like, the whole point is to 
to end suffering. So we don't have to become something for that. Yeah. So um, this person saying that they get the idea that um, suffering is causally arisen, basically, the product of causes. <laughs> but it's difficult sometimes to hear that um, happiness is as well. And that's also kind of not coming from a self as such. Yeah, is that kind of the thing? And uh, I don't know where this comes from. I think many of us sort of feel that way in the sense that we tend to disown the unpleasant experiences and then when we're feeling good we go yes I'm back to myself <laughs> I'm back to myself now this is like the real me um, but that too is just as conditioned um, so the Buddha's not saying that there is nothing there you know he has this classic phrase in the suttas he's not saying there's nothing because the rising is seen but he's not saying there's something because passing away is seen instead there's just a conditioned process so the only difference really is that we take that process to be a self and he's saying it's not a self. It doesn't mean there's nothing. It doesn't mean causality isn't functioning or that there's nothing we can do to put those causes in place. It's just that putting them in place has also been conditioned. So why do you practice metta? It's because someone's taught you that or it's because you've met people who exude metta or you've had a sense of you know, getting in contact with that and, and then you've had instructions and this is why. It's not actually coming from you, it's a whole chain of events that's led to it. So yes, we can try to put wise causes in place and we usually think it's coming from a self, but that too is conditioned because, I mean, I'm sure everybody would love to practice metta around the world, I hope, anyway. But if they've never heard the teachings, they've never had an idea what that is, maybe they're in a war-torn country and they're just trying to survive, then they're not going to actually, I mean, they might have tons and tons of metta, I would imagine they may, actually. You know, sometimes people in more um, unfortunate circumstances have more compassion for others, too. But, um, you know, they won't have had those exact teachings, therefore they won't practice that exact way. So, does that make sense? So it's not really us, it's more, there's more opportunity to make wise choices, let's say. Yes, great question. So this person saying that they um, get to the point where the breath disappears and then uh, the mind becomes a bit dull and sleepy, but if they put energy in at that point to try and um, kind of overcome the drowsiness, it all goes back several steps to the beginning. The breath comes, course again, exactly, exactly. So the reason the breath is starting to disappear is because the mind's becoming subtle and it's becoming refined, but it's still not subtle and refined and sensitive enough to notice uh, the mental aspect of the breath. So when the breath disappears, um, there's a kind of blank in the mind at first because the mind's just not bright enough to notice it. It hasn't actually gone unless you're in fourth jhana. It's still there, but it's incredibly subtle. And it's kind of the point where the breath is changing from a physical object to a mental object. And in the beginning, the mind is not bright enough to see that, to notice that. So what my teachers would always advise in that place is just to stay still, because it's the stillness that's got you to that point. And as you've noticed, as soon as this doer comes back, everything gets stirred up again. So the best thing to do at that point is to just wait with patience and don't worry about the drowsiness. The drowsiness is just like, I like Ajahn Brahm's simile, it's like going into a darkened room or going out in the night maybe with, you know, having come out of a bright room and you can't see anything at first. So you're kind of fumbling around, you know, objects aren't clear, you don't really know where you are because the eyes haven't adapted. And it's the same thing with the mind in this case, like the eyes of the mind haven't really woken up so you can't really see anything and because of that the mindfulness kind of slips but if you can just like stay still in that moment then yeah I mean it involves patience and it might involve a lot of time who knows but eventually the mindfulness will um, will increase sometimes the brain it's almost like the, the brain's been too active in our lives and it just needs to kind of rest and uh, yeah that experience I talked about where all this bliss started coming up in my practice was actually after many days of, of practicing like you mentioned and kind of getting into that drowsy state but just staying still because my teacher really told me do nothing and for once I actually did really nothing and then after a while it all started to brighten but 
yeah, this is in a retreat context, so it takes a bit of time, but it's, it's very good and it's quite natural that that's happening. So don't treat it as a hindrance, just, it's just a phase in the process. Yeah, so this person's asking about when the mind is like getting relaxed and enjoying the meditation, then lots of ideas start coming up and uh, they like to kind of follow those ideas, yeah? And uh, sometimes they don't do and then they wish they had done and <laughs> how to find the balance, yeah? So, uh, I mean, honestly, in a, in a day retreat, I think it's okay. Um, it's probably quite a good sign that your mindfulness is quite strong. Um, in my own practice, I, I find that when the mind gets clear, it does have lots of insights into everyday things or sometimes into the Dhamma, you know, and the Buddha actually said that's one of the last obstacles to go before the deep meditation. So honestly, in a day retreat, I wouldn't worry too much about that. I mean, I think the fact that you are having that clarity and that can then help you in your daily life is probably quite a good thing. Um, I think you know, if you're in a longer retreat, if you were, say, on seven days or 10 days retreat, um, that might come up in the first couple of days. And at that time, it might be better to, yeah, see how it feels to let it go. Um, if it's really vital, you could write a couple of things. But then, you know, at some point you'll realize, OK, maybe this opportunity to go deeper in meditation is more worthwhile than those preliminary um, insights because they are sort of based on wisdom worldly wisdom but they're not enlightenment insights so when you have a chance to go for something you know deeper then take that chance